Midlands uh, Packaging Society event, uh, this webinar. Uh, I'd particularly like to thank and welcome Andy and Matt, who I'm going to hand over in just a moment, who are going to be talking about rigid plastics. Just as a way of introduction, Matt, Matt Chapman is the technical manager for Sharpak Elsham. Um, he graduated in manufacturing system engineering and worked in the plastics industry for 27 years. And his responsibilities include engineering, design, tooling and process developments. Um, and his partner today is Andy Nuts Hunter, who is the UK retail director for Sharpak and of the Guilin Group. Uh, during his career, Andy has spent the majority of his time in flexible packaging, um, but switched to Sharpak in 2016. As the retail director, he works with brands and retailers alongside their uh, MPD teams. Andy has also both personal and professional interest in sustainability, forming the basis of many of the new projects and developments that he undergoes. Um, and without further ado, I would like to hand over to Andy um, to take it from here. Thank you, Tim. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'll just start the slideshow. Matt, I'll, I'll do a quick uh, two or three slides of intro very quickly covering off who we are as a business. And then Matt will go through the more uh, educated and technical elements of the presentation. OK, can everyone see the slides? Yes, thank you. Great, thank you. OK, so moving on. So uh, we're a family business. Uh, we're French owned now. Uh, that is our, pair, uh, our president and his daughter, uh, Francois and Sophie. Uh, as all good businesses, we started it 50 years ago in a garage. Um, we now operate in slightly larger uh, premises than garages. Um, have a wide European uh, production base uh, across the majority of Europe. Uh, and in terms of numbers, uh, manufacture significant number of products uh, across a number of different companies and countries. Um, and as I say, graduated significantly since that little garage in France in 1972. Uh, we manufacture products for a range of uh, different markets, all focused predominantly towards food. Um, and over the last and and over the last sort of 50 years, we've predominantly been based in plastics, but we have diversified over the last couple of years into non-plastics and hybrids of plastics and board as well through acquisition of board and paper manufacturing businesses in Europe. Um, just as the market and our customers' needs have changed, we've flexed with that to become a packaging solutions provider. Uh, in the UK, though, uh, we've got uh, four sites, and they are all plastic focused. Uh, Alsham is the site in Kent where Matt's going to be talking from. That's predominantly uh, PET, some polypropylene, uh, and it's the hub of our food on the move and food to go businesses, uh, products that are made in Europe. Uh, we have the uh, PET and CPET site in Bridgewater. We've got a PP site in Yate, uh, polypropylene site in Yate, and then we have a site in Hampshire, uh, which is uh, extruding, purely extruding our pet materials for our Alsham site. The Bridgewater and the uh, Yates site have their own in-house extrusion capabilities. So without further ado, that's us uh, and I'll pass you across to Matt. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Andy's mentioned before, we're predominantly a thermoforming business rather than injection moulding. However, I've taken some slides that Ian kindly sent over that refer to injection moulding. In my past, I've had experience with injection moulding at previous companies I've worked for. So if anyone has any questions about the two comparative technologies that I don't cover off, please ask me at the end. Obviously, it's horses for courses, to use a cliche. Uh, thermoforming uh, and injection moulding both have their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, thermoforming can give you problems with the actual strength of the material. I'll touch on in a moment how the thermoforming process works, but one of the problems we can have is we get sag on the material and that can make it unsuitable for thermoforming. Injection moulding, though, it's a melt phase process. It's you're forming in that molten phase material and it's suitable for all materials. Thermoforming has less expensive tooling. I'll touch on that in the, later with the prices. Injection moulding considerably more expensive. 
They've also got advantages not only on the price with thermoforming, but also the lead time on thermoforming, whereas the injection moulding can take longer to make. Injection moulding considerably more accurate in the dimension stability because it's a constrained forming process. You can get variations in more thickness to a design, whereas we don't have that control with the distribution in thermoforming. Because we're pulling with we're forcing air down. I'll touch on that in a moment with the, the, the picture. But because we use air to give us the pressure to form the tray, uh, we uh, get gauge variation uh, in the product. Both processes are actually in mold label uh, capable. Historically, 10 years ago, it was really only available for injection molding, but actually there have been massive improvements in the last few years in thermoforming. And for instance, this tray that you probably can't see in my hand, that is actually an in mold labeled tray. So the whole card is put into the thermoforming process and we thermoform the plastic. And that goes lighter and lighter and we can just do labels as well. So it does exist. Uh, good for short runs and long runs. Um, in many ways, it's the same as injection molding. It depends on the size of your tool, but we can quite happily get 800,000 uh, units out of a single thermoformer. Surface effects are limited on thermoforming because, again, we're only constrained on one side and we're forming against the tool. Uh, we can do certain surface finishes on one side, whereas injection molding, you've got complete control because you've got both sides of the tool. OK, Andy. So uh, thanks to Ian for this drawing. Um, for those who aren't aware, and I will I'll gloss over this a bit because it's not my area of expertise, but injection molding, uh, you've got a male and female part of the tool that closes. Um, molten plastic is uh, using a hydraulic or electric force forced through the gate and you get a forming. Considerable amount of clamping force is used to make sure that you don't get flashing, which is the waste material coming out the side of the mould. Um, it's then cooled. So it's, a, it's generally a slightly slower um, cycle time than you would get in thermoforming. And then the product comes out at the bottom, taken out by robotics, or some of them just jumble fall out of the bottom. The clamp forces before any uh, changes are considerable. Uh, a large part of the uh, energy in injection molding is to do with that clamp force. Um, off the top of my head, I, we used to use ones about 500 ton clamp force, and I believe that's quite a small machine. Hi, okay, Andy. So on the thermoforming, which I'll, I'm going to spend a lot of my time on, I'm just going to go through the process. How does it work? What's it good for? What are the limitations? And the challenges that we have going forward from energy, materials, carbon footprint, um, and life cycle analysis, and what we can do about product design and the next stage of probably reusable packaging. OK. OK, so this is a very, very crude version of the thermoforming process that we use down here at Elsham. Thermoforming comes in various forms. Um, two of the big ones, vacuum and pressure forming. At Elsham, we use pressure forming. Uh, with vacuum forming, it's purely just pulling vacuum into the bottom of a mould. Uh, pressure forming, we actually close the tool and we force quite a bit of, uh, well, six bar of air pressure to get a, a higher fidelity of moulding from it. We buy our material in from a sister site. Um, that's the reel on the left goes through a heater bank, infrared uh, black body heaters, uh, pretty high efficiency, but it still uses a lot of energy, uh, top and bottom. We heat the material up to 120 to 130 degrees, depends on the product. This is PET I'm referring to here. Um, so although it's very, very pliable, it's still in the solid phase, and, that, and that's quite important. Um, obviously, it gives us the strength to index that material through the machine. We then go into the forming tool, which is a reciprocating upper and lower tool. The upper tool also has an element called a plug. Now, what the plug does is a, is a similar shape to the product you're making, and it forces the material down into the cavity. So as well as that pre uh, pressure, air pressure of six bar, you're helping material to get into the bottom of the, uh, the, uh, the component. Really important with deep draw um, products. Uh, when we're talking about draw, it's a ratio of that cross, the narrowest part, if you like, versus the depth. Now, we're very comfortable one to one. Some of our tools, we can go down from one to one to one to 2.5. The problem as you go deeper and deeper, you get variations in the material, which is one of the weaknesses of thermoforming, and you can get very, very soft bottoms. Now, it's all rigid packaging we make, and you know the structure of the product serves a function. So the, the job of the plug is to make sure we get as much material down to the bottom as possible. But we are limited. 
than what we do. So we clamp this material around the top of the product. So that material in that area is what we're making that whole tray out of. So the deeper we go, the more we're stretching and working that material. That has a drawback. Uh, one of Because we're in the solid phase, we are stressing the product. So as the, the polymer, as you're pushing down, you build in stress into the, uh, the, uh, the product. If a heat source is applied to this product uh, much over, over 70 degrees later in its life, it will try and revert back to a flat sheet. So that's one of the disadvantages we have. But going back to the process now, after we've pushed that plastic down into the shape of the mold, it's been cooled by the tool. The tool's held at 16 degrees. So after a uh, forming time of about half a second, the mold will open, index through to the next station, which on this line is showing a cutting uh, station. So we have a bent, what we call a bent roll cutter. So just a, a blade in the shape of that rim or the, of the product. And what it does is it cuts out the product with the exception of a number of tags around the top of this tray. So the tags, they're very small, less than, the, less than probably half a millimetre in width. As the sheet then indexes out of the cut station, it goes into a stacker. And what we then do is we break the product out of the web and it gets stacked and packed. The waste web gets wound up, we send it to granulation, and then it's re-extruded in our process down at our sister site. OK, Andy. So what's it good for? Um, I've touched on quite a lot of this already. Uh, thin wall packaging, so where you're looking for a low cost, high volume product, pots, cups, trays. One of our biggest things we make down here is strawberry punnets. So although it's a simple strawberry punnet, it actually has to resist quite a lot of, uh, uh, well, considerable technical challenges. One of them being it's got to, it's got to protect the fruit. Uh, so if you're looking at strawberries, it's got to maintain the, uh, the fruit without bruising or going mouldy. So we have to put ventilation in it as well, which we, we do with an in, uh, inline punch tool. It's also got to be able to heat seal. Um, about 10 years ago, most of our customers moved over to heat sealing to reduce plastic, to get rid of the lids. So we get back to applying that heat on that rim around the top of the tray, wants to revert. So we need to make sure we've got enough material on that rim that it's going to resist that, um, that, that heat effect. Touch on the relatively deep uh, draw ratios. We can produce pint pots. Uh, we have to use a certain type of thermoformer to do that, an in-mold cup machine, but we can happily do a, a pint pot or a pint cup on one of our machines. Good optics. Because we're using PET, the material gets drawn down, so it's naturally thin as it goes in. We get very, very good contact clarity. And it's cost effective, so we can lay a tool set down to make a strawberry punnet for about 25,000. And that will happily make 500,000 units a day. And when you compare that to an injection molding tool, which is an order of magnitude more expensive, good strength to weight ratio has already touched on. What it's not so good at is the wall thickness control. And it's our biggest bugbear through our process is maintaining wall thickness. To an extent, it is uncontrolled. And we have to have a very, very tight process on our thermoforming parameters, temperature, pressures and run speeds to ensure that we're given a, that minimum thickness of material at the bottom of the tray. And I've already touched on the products is stressed and where you have to be careful applying heat to it. We have a thermoforming process in the group that uses melt phase rather than solid phase forming. And what we do is we cast onto a rotating uh, tool set directly from an extruder. And because we're forming in the melt phase, that product can be retorted. It's made in polypropylene as well, which helps uh, with the functional temperature, but it doesn't have the stress and it's more, uh, it's more, uh, uh, it doesn't suffer the incidents you get with uh, retorting. Okay, Andy? We use a hell of a lot of energy at Alsham. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're not the, the largest manufacturing process in the area. But we spend about a million pounds a year on electricity. We're expecting that to go up to three million in September. So energy is critical for us. And that's not going to get any easier. Uh, we have a climate charge levy agreement as because we are seen as being a high energy use, uh, usage company. Uh, but we have committed to reducing our energy over a, a certain amount over a, a series of years. And we have to keep on doing that. Otherwise, we get hit with carbon costs. So. Uh, We've taken out all the low hanging fruit on the energy reduction, but now we're struggling. The, the easiest thing we can do is buy new equipment. 
The older machines used to be hydraulic powered, all the new ones are electro servo, but we're running out of uh, bits of kit to replace. So the challenge is getting harder at the same time as the costs going up. We use the energy for heating the plastic, for forming the plastic with compressed air and for cooling it. So what we're doing is investing on different types of cooling equipment and different types of um, compressors. So we're in the process of replacing all our compressors with rotary vane servo compressors. So that gives us uh, about 14% reduction in energy. We've improved our chilled water system. So we're splitting it into two at the moment. So we have different temperatures for different parts of our process rather than heating them or uh, cooling them all to a lower temperature. We're looking at choosing where we use the energy uh, more effectively. Stopping leaks, compressed air is incredibly expensive. When you generate compressed air, 40% of it goes through the, the, the ceiling in waste heat. So one of the things we're looking at is reusing that heat for heating in the factory and also getting rid of leaks. You know, leaks cost a huge amount. At one stage, we were losing about 5% of our compressed air through leaks. And um, again, that ties into energy and switching stuff off. We've been doing this for years, but a real drive on making sure that people switch things off, switching machines off when they're not running um, and um, the usual bits with lights. OK, Andy. OK, one of the other challenges, recycle content. Plastic isn't the favourite material out there. It's had a lot of negative press and a lot of it is quite understandable. However, it's a very, very good material. Um, it performs well. It's got very good strength to weight ratio and it protects the product. And for things where you've got oil or moisture, there aren't many things that are as good as it. So we need to become more sustainable. Um, and the problem with that is we've got to get the material. If you go back three, four years ago, we could quite easily get recycled consumer from the bottle industry. But that's actually been used by the bottle guys now. And we've got to work with the MRFs and PERFs in our area to get that tray material. So we're doing a real closed loop process. So there's a number of uh, uh, projects going on with uh, MRFs and PERFs at the moment to get that material into the product. But the challenges that come with that as well, as you're increasing the post consumer, you need to make sure that you're protecting, you know, the food safety. Yeah, the, the consumers aren't going to be impacted by and uh, negatively by issues with that material quality. So we have to keep our eye on the food safety, the impact strength as well. As we include more and more post consumer, we get problems with impact strength if we're not careful, if the IV drops too low. And clarity. Clarity oh. these days isn't as important as it used to be. But we are getting um, more and more issues with clarity. But there are things we can do to actually help this on. Encourage customers to get rid of colours. If we go for mono materials, taking out the barriers, uh, the polyethylene layers that we used to use on the polypropylene for a good heat seal, all of these things simplify the um, the recycling route. Next stage is actually investing in the equipment. So we've spent quite a lot of money on cleaning material to make sure that we can super clean the material when it comes in so that we can mono extrude it rather than co extrude it. Uh, historically, with co extrude, it would have the recycled content in the middle and it'd be sandwiched between virgin layers. But obviously, that adds complexity, cost, and increases the amount of virgin material you use. So, we've been investing in uh, cleaning technology to remove that issue. And you've got to have the systems behind it with the packaging uh, waste uh, tax that's coming. We need to make sure that we can show that we've got that material content that we're putting the 30% in and that the material that we're using is safe and has come from an approved source. Okay. So smart factories have spoken about quite a lot and it, it kind of ties in with many of the topics I've already spoken of. You know, energy, as I've said before, is a real, it's a real driver of cost in our business. And um, one of the things we're looking at from a smart factory point of view is at the moment, we already submeter all our lines. So all our compressors, all our all our thermal machines, they actually have submetering. So anytime I can look at the energy that I'm using. But the next step is to actually use that for specific products. So if we're making product A to truly understand how much water, how much electricity, how much compressed air is used for that specific product, because I can guarantee you our costing model will not reflect those individual uh, variations that go, they, they do change from product to product. At the moment, we use an average. 
the thing is then you can actually target the products that are using more energy to see if you can improve them if there's anything you can do to the tools to drop the energy uh, energy out of them so it's understanding that true value of the energy or the use of the energy and the environmental impact that, that comes that comes with it and part of this comes with the factory 4.0 getting that data in real time and alongside the engineering diagnostics to understand our machines so that if there's deterioration in mechanical linkages in the machines then if we see those servo drives ramping up on their consumption that we can actually predict that uh, breakdown before it comes and that reduces the downtime the cost and waste but also it enables us to focus our engineering resource because that resource is getting harder and harder to come by so all of this information will also feel, feed into our life cycle analysis one of the things we've been working on is a true understanding of the impact of a product from its inception all the way through to its end of life. And LCAs require a considerable amount of information and we need to tailor our process and our equipment to actually give us that information in real time. Okay, Andy. So the future, uh, last slide here really, designing the product, getting the plastic out, down gauge into reduce the amount of plastic involved, but also not taking it too far that then the product doesn't become recyclable. We were caught out a few years uh, back with a product we got lighter and lighter with, and we thought we were doing a fantastic job. But when we checked it with our local uh, Murph down the road, actually that was a Perf rather than Murph, which is the plastic, uh, polymer plastics recycling facility, they told us actually we'd gone too far and that, that product would give them problems actually recycling it because it was too flimsy and it'd break up. So, Design's important, but it's to, to understand it's not just the customer's requirements, it's actually that recycling down the route. Getting rid of the colours. I've spoken about it before, but you know, the, the fewer colours, getting rid of the pigmentation from polyester, going for a natural uh, pet makes it so much easier to recycle and reuse that material. And reusable product. We've uh, been doing uh, developments for a, a number of customers on reusable packaging. So this is going completely opposite to where we've been going with the down gauging, and that's going for a much heavier gauge product. So polypropylene generally, because they have to be cleaned at high temperature, but perhaps 1200 micron versus a 500 micron would normally do. And the, the product's designed so that it can be used 20 or 30 times before it gets to its end of life. And when it gets to its end of life, then doing a closed loop recycling in our facilities to make sure that material, there's no loss to that material. There, there's challenges that come with that, so we have to be resistant to stain. So one day this product may have curry in it, the next day may have fruit in it, and it's just trying to understand how we can prevent the staining and what is acceptable to the customer. And when we're having 20 uses, we need to know the history of that product. So do we need an RFID tag? Is it added after the process? Is it added during the manufacturing process? All these things are the challenges that we're working on at the moment. And as I've said, end of life, taking that product, grading it. Is it fit to be recycled? And if it isn't, what's the route through it? Do we do chemical recycling or do we just say, no, actually we're going to convert it into energy and incinerate it? So it's a challenging, challenging few years ahead of us. And I think Andy, switching <coughs> over, that could be the last slide. I thank you very much for that. Um, if there's any questions or comments, please feel free. So I'm just checking the chat for you now, Matt. Uh, if people could put their questions into the chat box, please, um, I can read them out. I've received a, a few questions uh, from folk who are unable to make the meeting, but on the basis they know it's being recorded and it will be shared with them later. Um, I am going to throw these out to begin with. So, Matt, I think um, sustainability of thermoforming versus blow molding with other materials. Why is plastics best? Yeah, it's a tricky one. I, uh, it's not a case of plastics are best. It's getting the right product to the right application. So, I, th I think if you look, you only pick up any newspaper, it's telling you that food. Is going to get more and more expensive and we have food manufacturers uh, and it all comes down to reducing waste uh, we we as business we can make packaging in a number of ways we've got pulp we've got card we've got plastic now i work for a plastic site so i'll always be giving you the positive 
but plastic does have a purpose in that it's very, very lightweight. Polyester is intrinsically recyclable, um, but it is, it is a case that you've got to choose the product to suit the product that's going in it. So if you've got anything that has oil or moisture, polyester and plastic packaging give you a very cost effective way of protecting and transporting that material. OK, thank you, Matt. To line on that one. Um, I'm not sure if this is for Matt or for Andy. Um, why is tooling so expensive? <laughs> That's, that's, that's definitely a Matt. That's definitely yeah. a Matt question. Yeah. Uh, well, I'd like to say it's not that expensive. Uh, it, so our tooling we make is aluminium. So if a forming tool with the cutting and the stacking, you're looking at about twenty five thousand. Um, tool prices have gone up with metals. So that same tool, maybe five years ago, would have cost me about fifteen thousand. So that's one aspect of it. So from a thermoforming point of view, that's quite cheap. That's pressure forming. You can get vacuum forming tooling cheaper. So vacuum forming quite often, the, all the details in the base tool and you have a standard pressure box that just sits over the door, or a plug frame, sorry, not a pressure box. Um, a vacuum tool you can probably get for about five to 7,000. The difference being is with the vacuum tool, they're good for shallow trays, but not so good for deeper trays. If you then go up to the next level, so for instance, this tray I've got in my hand, we're punching holes in that. So to the tool to form that tray and make it's 25,000. The tool to make the four holes in the bottom of it is 60,000. And that's because it's jig ground. It's a it's a tool still. So we have to have a company jig grind it. Very, very slow process. I can turn this tool round for thermoforming. If I've got a really willing tool maker, you can make me that tool in uh, between a week, two weeks, if they've got nothing else on. A jig ground tool, you're probably looking more like 12 weeks to get it through and of course it because the process is so long there's labor involved there's machinery there's depreciation that just feeds into the tool price well okay thank you um i was gonna say actually one other thing uh uh injection molding why they're so expensive the the biggest uh tonnage our uh tools have to resist is 60 tons Injection molding, 250, 500, uh, huge pressures. As a result, they make their tools out of similar materials that I make my hole punches out of. So how it may have changed, but when I used to be involved many years ago, they'd machine a lot of the tooling through EDM, so electro discharge machining. It's an expensive, it's a slow process. And on top of that, the material you're making out of is incredibly expensive. So it's time and material. Do you know where the material comes from? Does it is it sort of from China or, it's not or... China? Yeah, there's a lot of it does come from China. Um, yeah, most of our material is coming from China, if you be perfectly honest. And are they tooled in the UK? Are they the so, tools made in the UK? Yeah, so we, we have a mixture. So all our thermoforming tools are made in the UK. Our hole punch tools we make actually in Taiwan. Uh, we do make some in the UK as well, actually, but we find the response time in Taiwan is a little bit better. They're better at some things, the UK are better at others. It, it, it's a bit of a balancing act. Okay. Um, the next question, um, developments in food packaging, more material goes down the mono material. Let's assume that's for recycling. I think you've sort yeah. of touched on that in the presentation. Um, but in essence, you've said that there was polyester um, and uh, polypropylene. Do you use other materials? Yeah, yeah, we do. So um, polyester comes in two forms. So we do the standard amorphous, your fruit pun, it's nice and clear, uh, not very good for temperature at all. Um, then we do CFET, the crystalline version. So that's your ready mills. So we make that down at our Bridgewater site. The problem with uh, CPET is you have to have basically two moulds. You have one where you form it and one where you crystallise it. So the tooling is more expensive. It generally runs a little bit slower. So they're the two types of polyester we use. Uh, we also make polypropylene. Polypropylene is great for anything where it's high temperature. If you want to stick something in the microwave, PP is good. You can do the same with CPET actually, but CPET's much more expensive from a tooling point of view. 
So if you don't need to stick in a conventional oven, polypropylene is better than CPIP. Polypropylene has a drawback, though. All these things have drawbacks. It's choosing the right thing. The problem with polypropylene at the moment is trying to get the uh, post-consumer recycler in it for tax reasons. Getting super clean or clean polypropylene back from the reprocessors has challenges. It's something we're actively working on ourselves, our competitors and the industry. But um, yeah, it's a slight more complex process. Uh, polyethylene can be applied to polyester for a sealing layer. Um, it's very good. It used to be the uh, the main way of sealing packs in the meat industry. So if you get in your chicken or uh, beef and it was in polyester, there'd be a polyethylene liner on it uh, mm -hmm. that improved the seal integrity. Although there are now mono versions that don't need that, which is great because it actually massively complicates recycling for us internally as well. Because what we like to do is to, we'd like to take that waste material and recycle it and regrind it. If you've got polyethylene layers on it and you grind that up and try to extrude it, it gives you problems with the polyester. So uh, any move to mono is good for the environment and it's good for us from an operational point of view. OK, um, and thickness of the film that you start with, does that vary much? It, does, it, it comes down to customers uh, specification quite often. Um, they'll have a requirement for the number of Newton meters you've got to compress a product by. Um, but however, if that same customer is asking that not only have you got to resist, I don't know, 20 newtons, but it's also got to be very, very deep, then the gauge goes up accordingly. Um, it is part of the design process. We we have a series of benchmarks. We can look at a product and the specification when it comes through. And we know from past experience that that depth, that draw ratio, we may need 500 micron of polyester. But as part of the design process, we'll get samples uh, we'll do prototyping and then we'll get a true feel for actually what gauge it needs to be. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's worked out through trials with customers on the lines. Ian's got his hand up, Ian. Yes, Ian. Yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, Ian Morris here. Uh, question just going to you, Matt, just from a, a minute ago. You talked about mono materials. So you're using, say, a PET base layer. That's right. Uh, without a polyethylene, which I assume has been co-extruded on yeah. top of it. So you've taken that off. How do you actually then bond the film layer? Actually, that's probably one for Andy because it's from that background. But it's, uh, yeah, it's to do with the adhesive technology on the ceiling layer. There's an adhesive. Andy, do you want to step in at that point? Because you're oh, lucky, lucky me. man. Lucky you're me. Right. Uh, yeah, so the, the sealing uh, capability all comes from the coating that applies to the that gets applied to the the film, the the lidding film itself. So oh, cool. as the Matt mentioned, the meat market traditionally used a, a PET PE tray, and it was the PE element that helped give that weld seal that the the, the protein guys need for their MAP packaging. Um, where they've moved to to mono trays, the technologies uh, increased. In the, in the lidding film. So the technology in terms of the coatings they put on it to create that weld seal or re replicate that weld seal they used to have in a very low tech way has been replaced with coatings. Um, one thing we find in terms of process when when our trays and our, and the, our, our colleagues in films send their product into a packer is there's a, um, to create the perfect pack, there's, there's, there's several elements. There's the tray, there's the film, there's the machine it's been film sealed on and there's the operator running the machine um, and there's an awful lot of misunderstanding in the process industry where they believe to get a very good seal of film to a, a tray is you have to heat it very high and for a very long time so we've been at a, a company recently where they're heating sort of in the 190 200 degrees c for like 0.9 of a second to get the right seal the perfect seal on our trays with the right film you can go down to 130 degrees, probably I'm right, Matt, mm -hmm. and for about 0.2 to 0.5 maximum. Um, I think the human nature is they think if they put a lot of heat and, and uh, time on it, it will help build that bond. In fact, what you end up doing is burning through the ceiling layer that the film has and actually weakening any bond you have. So it's counterintuitive and it actually makes the packs look really bad because you get the curling on flanges. A lot of what they call dog bow dog bone effect or bowing in the in the sidewalls of the tray because of the heat being applied to it. 
So there's a lot of technology in the film that works with the trays, but ultimately to get the right pack, it's a combination of, of all those elements mm. and the training and the education for the operators. And our customers have done quite a lot of development actually uh, to improve their process. One of the reasons for the PE was for contamination of the seal. So for instance, if you put in chicken in and you get some of the chicken fat or juice on that seal, that's, that's horrific, but um, you'd have problems and the polyethylene allowed the seal to burn through that and kind of weld on. So there's been uh, major developments. Our customers make sure that contamination is reduced, which has helped with the uh, development of the mono sealing. Hmm. Just following up on that, I know in the press in the last month or two, there's been some talk of uh, keeping the film uh, sort of bonded to a certain extent with the tray and then putting all of that into the waste stream. So assuming you've got a polyester film and you've got a polyester tray, but it's got um, you know, acrylic or some form of adhesive coating on the film. Have you had any experience of that with, you know, going further down the supply chain? Yeah, so one of our customers does a pack format. It's a fruit packaging and the, the there's a weld on the top um, to the rim. And then when you open it, it opens a window and it's done through an adhesive system. The, the film is thicker, but it is polyester and it goes through uh, to the recycler as one unit. Um, Andy, I don't know if you want to um, add to that one. Yeah, yeah, we've uh, so basically exactly what Matt says. There's a number of companies out there doing uh, film um, uh, technology that enables that consumer convenience of multiple serve, peel and reclose. Um, and yes, it does enable then the the PET film to remain attached to the tray, so the consumer is not taking a piece of very lightweight flexible film off and putting it into a uh, a black sack it's going through uh, with the PET trade to a recycling process um, uh, and it's it's there very much for, for, for functionality as much as it is for uh, recycling. I mean I mean in a way that I, I, I mean on the television this week they're, they're having this um, uh, what is it a, a, a survey I suppose is the best description of it is people actually noting what sort of plastics they are collecting um you know in a way good on them because this is it, it's an interesting exercise and if they can get many thousands of people um i suppose my only concern is will the customer actually understand what type of plastic they are actually handling or Will it be a crisp bag compared to, I don't know, I'm just trying to think of something off the top, top of my head, you know, maybe some plastic that you've got that's come through the post with Amazon. Mm. You know, so one the, will almost the, certainly be polypropylene for the, the crisp bag. The, the bag from Amazon will almost certainly be polyethylene. Uh, <laughs> It will be interesting to see the results of that, and it's just taking up your comment or your your reply of you know keeping film and tray together so long as they are the same material. Um, you know, yeah, it, that... it, it's all down to the recycling companies. I say recycling, the sorting companies, because mm. that's what they do. Mm. The, the, yeah, that you're talking about the big plastic count, the the uh, the Greenpeace um, survey that's going on. Um, interestingly, I've I've just signed up to it. There's looking further at it. So number one, as a just talking in packaging in general, all the the retailers, the the the, the brands, the manufacturers, and the packaging businesses can do is to present the the consumer ultimately with the best choice of materials to make it as easy as possible to recycle, and then put the facilities in place for the recycling to occur. Um, the, you then move into a social sort of um, element where if someone's going to litter, you know, you can give them the best, most mono, mono recyclable, recyclable piece of packaging in the world. If they're not going to dispose of it um, with um, good intent and the right, right uh, in the down the right waste stream, you can't do much more than that. So all we can always do as an industry, the whole of the food, 
retail and package industry is give people the the root of least resistance to make the right choice. Um, the thing with the the big plastic count is um, there seems it, it's 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 counting the pieces of plastic, but then it's from what I can tell so far, having just delved into it, it's not giving the people taking part in the survey an option as to whether they are placing the plastics in a recycling bin or whether they're placing the plastic in a bin. So it's it's rather the it's counting the amount of plastic, but it's not counting the the route it then goes from from the consumer. Um, and obviously what you'd hope from a survey of this size or potentially of this size is to actually call out that there's more of a need for the recycling infrastructure to be developed and the good use of, of the right materials rather than just calling out plastic as look how many pieces of plastic we get into our households is yes. where does it go after that but and that's that's my comment on that piece and to be fair there's there's a number of initiatives going on to actually improve it to make it easy to recycle because it is complex you know we've all know about it, it varies from council to council uh, you've got the likes of the one bin project being done by the Royce Institute and the University of Manchester looking at going for a one bin solution to plastics recycling and the psychology behind uh, recycling yeah you know, we're a producer of plastic you know we've got to put our hands up just drive down the A2 down in me and there is plastic everywhere you know there's no getting away from it there is a problem and we can come up with the best solutions for recycling product, but you've got to have the will of people. And we've got to start getting involved in that as well, even if it's working outreach to schools, um, to local colleges, just to get people ingrained from a young age that, you know, this is a valuable resource. And don't litter, use it, recycle it, and make it easy for them to do it. Yeah, thank you very much, Matt. And can, thank you, Andy. Um, I've got another question here um, with regards to the future of plastic packaging. Given the reuse and refill initiatives we're now seeing right across Europe, I know in France um, they legislated back in, I think, April last year that any supermarket with a 400 square metre size or more would have to give over 20 percent of its store to refill and reuse space. Um, I know the Netherlands are looking at something similar and the UK, of course, is also quite active in this area now. So I suppose the first part of the question is, would there be a change in plastic materials given they're likely to be a lot thicker? I, I spy, I can start this one very quickly. Matt's been very heavily involved in the, the technical <coughs> side of this. Uh, so yes, uh, we're being we're involved in a lot of collaborative pieces now in terms of reuse and refill um, for food packaging. Um, uh, yes, I see our business in the future making less uh, billions of single use or th in theory single use items in lightweight materials um, and making you know, less volume, but higher and more substantial, thicker pieces of plastic to go through a reuse format. Um, plastic is uh, an ideal um, material for that. There's also glass, there's also aluminium. Mm. Obviously, they come with their own energy intensive processes and it's finding, again, as Matt said, the horses for courses, the right product for the right end use. Um, but as an example, I think, Matt, we've done some reuse products recently where we'd normally manufacture 500 micron, but we're up at about 1400 micron yeah so it's it's nearly sort of three times the thickness but it's it's been designed to go through 50 plus uh reuse cycles and that's a, a full supply chain cycle through uh packing delivery through a supply chain retail in store to a consumer back through a supply chain cleaning and refilling so Mm -hmm. um it's it's it, it's learning it's it's a learning curve Ron, but it's the, the materials we're making are, are very suitable for reuse definitely i i think it's the future you know a large part of the future anyway um but there, there's there's a couple of hurdles there's the technology hurdle we go which i touch on the staining and the tagging making sure you know where it is but you've also got to accept that we're saying that some people can't be bothered to put packaging into a recycling bin outside the back door so you've still got to get over that hurdle you've got someone who's got to take that packaging back to a retail or a central point to reuse it so there's ways you can do monetary um you can do mon monetary incentives and in some way the closed loop packaging lovely packaging the reusable but there is a cost that uh, there is a cost to entry on that and in 
the, my, the only worry at the back of my mind is we come up with these things and to get people to bring it back, you're going to have to have some sort of deposit on it. But all of this is going to add to inflation. Although you get the money back, it's that entry to the, uh, the, the cost. Mm. It, it, isn't, there's not going to be one answer. There's going to be a, a range of answers, but none of this is going to be easy. And it's going to require people changing the way they go around their life lifestyles and how they buy stuff. Okay. A question from me then is uh, you've touched on life cycle analysis <clears throat> and carbon, carbon footprinting. Global warming sadly is with us and it's going to be around for quite a long time to come. So whilst I would not take anything away from the initiative to, re, uh, to refill and reuse plastic materials, has there been some analysis to show that to go for this thicker material for reuse, refill, it needs to go through this uh, loop a minimum of 20, 30 times versus the one trip solution that's typically bought today. Yeah. Yeah, I, as you say, there's a, a variety of different um, themes around what denotes reuse. So, uh, on pack recycling, uh, labeling, OPRL, uh, we're members of, uh, they have a, a reuse, refill, return me label system, and that calls for a product to be uh, capable of going through 10 cycles. Mm -hmm. um, I was in a seminar last week where a, a major global brand of, of home care said they think uh, in their product range, anything that's that's five plus denotes reuse. Um, mm -hmm. And we're working in projects with um, home delivery and food, takeaway food to go elements where they're asking for reuse of about 100 cycles. But the, the question so, is, though, I agree with you, Andy, but the question is, where's the tipping point? So if you're looking at that carbon footprint, where's the tipping point? Given the moving around, the, the extra weight, the detergents, the energy, is it actually more effective just to recycle lighter weight packaging? And uh, it's, a fair, it's a fair question. So. We've embarked on this journey. Um, the LCA is part of it. We don't have that information. The information is being formulated, but it's a really critical question because the danger is you become you become foolish. And the reality is, and the sad reality, is, it's not a world I want to live in at all. But plastic littering, the A2, or floating in the sea, won't make an Africa. It's horrific. And it's a symptom of how badly we're degrading our environment. But the thing that will kill us is CO2 mm. and temperature raising and lack of water in Africa. So the question, we've got to focus on CO2. And I, I'm not saying that plastic is the solution to this at all, because at the moment we haven't got that information. This is where LCA really comes into it to truly understand the impact on the environment. But again, it comes back to in the next five, 10 years, this is going to impact everyone's lives. You know, we're going to be so focused. I, I personally believe that you shouldn't be able to sell a product. Not now, because we've got to put the systems in, but you shouldn't be able to sell a product without knowing a full LCA of what you're producing. And it can't be just something you just chuck out of a bit of software in the back room. It's got to be a third party audited report. You know, the same as your tax or whatever. It, it's vitally important. And if packaging is going to have any form of credibility, we've got to have this information. So and I, and I would, I, personally, I would agree with you 100%. I think we actually need businesses to look at carbon footprinting in the same way they look at cost. Because the mm. irony is, wherever there's a cost, either the materials or the manufacturing process, whether that's direct or indirect, wherever there's a cost, you can bet your bottom dollar, there's a carbon footprint label or value there as well. And until businesses can start to consider carbon in the same way they take very seriously the cost to their business, I think we've got an issue for businesses, let alone just pushing it back to poor behaviour by consumers, which I agree with you again. Yeah, we, we, we've just bought SEMA Pro. So I had a fun four days training in Leon last September with SEMA Pro, so it's a, a well-known bit of LCA software. So from our point of view, we're doing it for two reasons. One is, you know, 
So we've got the LCA information for products for our customers. Great. Actually, for me, from an, as an engineering point of view, I'm actually more interested in the hotspot function of it. As you say, understand the hotspots in your process because carbon energy is uh, intrinsically linked. Mm. Uh, and it, everything, all our margins are being pressed at the moment um, with energy, raw materials going up, labor, trying to get labor. And I believe LCA and using it correctly, not just for flag waving, will reduce your cost and increase your profitability. Yeah, yeah. In in my role in in, in working with the retailers and the brands, obviously, uh, mm. Mr. Attenborough and Blue Planet had a significant uh, effect on on the perspective uh, the perspective of the public towards plastics and uh, towards packaging. You know, take my sharp hat hat off uh, for a moment. Um, if he'd have made one more episode that was still focused on the oceans and still focused on Blue Planet, but talked about um, rising sea levels and rising sea temperatures we would have been dealing with a carbon tax now, not a plastic tax, because then it would have more focus on the bigger picture. Um, but saying that, you know, we are a plastics manufacturer, but as I said at the start of, of the presentation, we've invested in paper and board businesses. So I think what we're trying to do as a as a business, with that as becoming the advert, sharp hat back on, um, is to be a solutions provider. And we hope we can go to our customers if they have a product to pack, we can give them an option in plastics, an option in paper and board, or an option with a hybrid of the two, give the commercial offering and give them a third party audited LCA for it or a carbon footprint statement for it. So the customers can make an informed decision and they, you know, ultimately they still have to sell a product through their shops to a consumer, but at least they know the impact it's going to make either on their commercial bottom line or their carbon footprint bottom line. But we just want I think to be positioned to I, do that. I agree, but I think the reason why blue planet was had such impact is plastic waste is tangible you literally walk outside you can't go more than 10 yards and you're finding a bit of plastic somewhere co2 and rising co2 levels it's it's out there we all know it's happening they've been preaching i was at school a primary school in the 70s they've been talking about it but it's one of those things that people can put off they'll get they're going to get the electric car in a couple of years time and the prices come down They'll they'll cut back on the holidays and not flying as well. Yeah, we'll do that later. Or that's someone else to do it. I think it's it is harder for people to grasp the reality of the CO2 issue that we have at the moment. Mm. We've kind Can of I, digressed away from the thermoforming, but yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so guys, we've got just a couple of minutes left uh in our schedule. Are there any other questions that uh, anyone would like to raise with Andy or Matt? And in the absence of that, I'd like to do a quick plug on behalf of the Packaging Society. Our next event coming up is going to be on July the 27th. It's an in-person event at Loughborough University. Uh, it's an annual event that we've held with the only gap being driven by COVID, where we do a Pack to the Future event. This year, we're celebrating the 75th anniversary of our organisation, which was initially the Institute of Packaging, uh, and now um, more recently the uh, ION3, the Institute of Materials, Minerals and Mining. <clears throat> um, what might you see uh, or hear? Um, what packaging was like many years ago? Compare that to what it's like today and um, what might it look and be like in the future? We've got some real top people um, coming along from retailers, brand, consultancy, environmentalists, end of life. Uh, and I would encourage you to look out for our notification that's coming in uh, the near future. And if there isn't any last minute questions or comments from anybody, I'll pause for a second. Ian? No, I, I just wanted to say thank you very much, everybody. And that's where I was going to finish, to say thank you very much, um, firstly to Sharpak, Gwilin, to Matt and Andy for giving their time over and their openness and their transparency. It's very refreshing. Thank you. Um, to my colleagues on the committee who've helped um, pull this together in different ways. 
So thank you to them. And, and just as important, thank you to all of you who've taken the time out of your very busy schedules to listen to us. And um, I look forward to uh, sharing with you more insights either in July or later in the year with other webinars. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.